Well, hello there. It is Wednesday, and if you are watching live, it's Wednesday evening, and that means it is time for Live with Pastor Adam. And I've got a, a new setup. i got a new standing desk to where I'm able to kind of stand at my computer and operate uh, the uh, PowerPoint to be able to, to draw for you. But uh, I have uh, the privilege of serving as the pastor at Central Baptist Church. Uh, we are located right on the banks of the Ohio River. River in Maysville, Kentucky. At, uh, thank you for uh, coming uh, with me tonight as we as we go through uh, the Bible and uh, we uh, go line by line, verse by verse, uh, and uh, digging in uh, a little deeper than I normally would in a Sunday message. And so uh, I am going to go through John chapter 2 verses uh, 12 through 22 tonight which was the message that I preached uh, this past Sunday. If you weren't able to uh, see it in person or uh, uh, watch it online, you can do so on our website at cbcmaysville.com. And uh, go there and uh, watch uh, watch that. And then um, as we kind of dig in a little deeper tonight in, uh, in this passage, particularly this passage, there's uh, several themes in there. And uh, so usually when I preach, I want to kind of uh, hit on one of those and so uh, sometimes I'm not able to get into uh, depth into everything in a in a Bible passage. Uh, but uh, um, if you are uh, watching, I uh, would appreciate it if you would uh, give this video a like, give it a thumbs up, uh, share it. Uh, we are live on Facebook and uh, YouTube on our website at cbcmaysville.com. And uh, if you would like to know more about our church, uh, go to our website at cbcmaysville.com and you can can learn more about that. Also, if I can be praying for you, uh, please uh, connect with us on our, our prayer hotline. That number is 305-707-PRAY. It's 305-707-7729. Well, are you ready? Let's uh, dig into the Word. So my message from this past Sunday was, Where's Your Heart? Which comes from John chapter 2, verses 12 through 22 which is in our uh, series, The Gospel of John, so that you may believe. And so uh, this message uh, comes on the, the, the heels of uh, the, the first 12 verses of John 2, where Jesus performed his first miracle, where he turned the water into wine at, at Cana, at the wedding feast there. And so we see uh, at that moment kind of one of the things that, uh, that that Jesus made known to his mother was that his time had not yet come. And so while this was his first miracle, it was concealed. He did not uh, reveal to everyone there that he uh, has the ability to do miracles, that he is the Son of God. But now in this passage we're going to look at tonight, we're going to see things change. And now, really, as Jesus began his ministry, you know, a little while ago here, he's kind of making that making that public. And so uh, let us uh, dig into our passage and then we will uh, mark it up and uh, look at uh, some uh, ways that we can apply it uh, to our, our, our lives as well. So I'll read kind of a paragraph at a time. Go back and we'll look at it and uh, and uh, take it from there. So here we are in John chapter two verses uh, thirteen through twenty two. We'll start out here with the uh, go through verse seventeen. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of, of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. All right, well, let's go back here to the beginning. And so uh, at the very beginning here, we uh, see that the Passover uh, of the Jews was at hand. And uh, so 
the Passover, uh, let me get my pencil here ready to go. So the Passover of the Jews uh, was a festival that took place every every year. And in fact, it has, plays a special uh, role in, in the Gospel of, of John. Most of, of, of God, John's Gospel takes place of uh, this Passover week, um, which leads from uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem with his death, burial, and resurrection. And, um, and so this is uh, the, the first Passover account in, in John's gospel. And so the Passover of, of the Jews was at hand. And I went in a little more of the historical detail in my, in my message um, with regards to why this was such a, a big deal with th- uh, this taking place in the temple and the selling all of these animals. Why would uh, we have, uh, you know, a currency exchange going on? And it was because um, uh, the Passover is when uh, Jews from all over would come to Jerusalem and they would, um, the all males uh, over eight, 19 were required to pay a temple tax. So they would need money uh, in order to get into the temple. And uh, they would need a un, or they would need a clean animal uh, to offer as a sacrifice for their sins, which uh, took place each year on the Day of, of Atonement. And so the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now we also see that he went up to Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem uh, was uh, at a higher elevation than uh, than much of the rest of of Israel, and uh, in the temple itself was kind of the, the pinnacle of, of Jerusalem. Everything um, was around uh, the Temple Mount, and so to go to the temple, you would you would go up. And uh, and so the temple complex was a very large complex. Um, it, was, it consisted about one-sixth sixth of the entire size of the city of Jerusalem. And the normal population in Jesus' day of Jerusalem would have been anywhere from 80 to probably 100,000 people. Uh, not a small town uh, city, but, uh, but during Passover week, that population would swell to around 3 million people. And, and so, uh, you know, Jerusalem was uh, was packed uh, went during uh, during the Passover over week. And then in verse fourteen, we we see there at the, that they are at the temple. And so when Jesus goes into the temple, um, there are uh, people are selling things. We're selling animals, right? Oxen, sheep, and pigeons. Um, now, like me and I wonder, why are we selling these these animals? Uh, they uh, because they are clean animals, uh, and uh, they are being offered as as animal sacrifices for uh, the payment of of their sins. And um, and so, why they are selling them there is, uh, you know, people are traveling into Jerusalem. Um, it would be easier in some cases for them to purchase an animal there versus uh, bringing them uh, bringing them with them. Uh, and uh, you know, there's been several times where I've traveled outside of of the country, and if you go into you know, flying with um, a, a lot of luggage and uh, particularly, you know, personal items and you never know what's going to get caught in security and, and all of that mess. And so there are times where uh, certain things that I will just uh, uh, leave at home and buy when I when I get to my destination. And uh, while it's not a, a, a one-to-one uh, illustration here, uh, it's similar, uh, is that they are waiting to buy their, um, their sacrificial animal um, at at the temple uh, instead of carrying it uh, with them. And the same deal with uh, with having the money changers. Um, so kind of think of it as currency exchange. People are coming from different countries with other currencies. They didn't have shekels, which was required at, at the temple. So there were these money changers that were there to uh, to exchange that that currency. Now, uh, before we get into Jesus uh, going off here uh, on on these vendors, um, there are two accounts in um, in the Gospels on Jesus um, cleansing the temple, and uh, this is, one is in the Gospel of John. The other three uh, Gospels um, have a, a another account 
of Jesus cleansing uh, the temple. That one takes place um, right as at the end of Jesus' life, the the last Passover week. And so uh, Jesus comes in, you know, on the, the donkey into on uh, Palm Sunday, and then he goes, sees the temple, and he cleanses it again. And so, um, you know, there, there's different opinions on, as to, um, you know, did John just uh, choose to uh, put this one at the beginning, not thinking so much, because his gospel is not always laid out chronologically. Um, but uh, most of the conservative uh, scholarship, I believe that they are two separate uh, separate events, and I tend to uh, think that as as well. And so, um, so Jesus comes in and he he sees what is 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 going on here. Now, why this is a a big deal um, is because um, you know in in years past and even there, um, you know, a lot of this activity would take place outside of of the temple in the streets and, um, leading up to the temple. And if you've ever been into the old town in Israel in Jerusalem, uh, there is a market that is around. Uh, around the temple, but as things get bigger and more people want to to to, to sell, and uh, let's just face it, that um, history tells us that Ananias, the uh, the high priest, uh, was actually uh, kind of spearheading uh, having these uh, vendors in the temple, and and so slowly it had creeped into the temple. So it's not so much what is taking place here that that um, the money changing and the buying of sacrificial animals is bad. It's just where it was taking place. And, um, and, and so we see, you know, they may even just been a compromise over years, a little by little by, by little. But the problem that we see here with it is because of, of their, uh, moving into the temple, um, the, the area with which, oh, let me go back here. The area with which they were, um, in was called the, um, the court of the Gentiles. So the temple I showed a picture in the during the message. So go back and watch that. But uh, the temple uh, is divided into different sections and um, and with different levels of exclusivity. Uh, and so um, the the most exclusive uh, place is the Holy of Holies. And the, only the high priest is allowed in there once a year on the Day of Atonement uh, for um, to, to offer the sacrifice for the sins of, of the people. And um, and then from out from there, there are um, other levels. And the outer court, which is the court of the Gentiles, was reserved only for, uh, well, anybody could, but the Gentiles could not go beyond that. Now, uh, if you're watching, not f- familiar with Christianity, a Gentile is anyone that is not of a Jewish descent or an Israelite. And so um, many of the Gentiles um, did believe in God, the God of the Old Testament Bible. And so uh, they came to worship just as the Jews did, um, but they could not go into the inner courts. And so they worshiped in, in the outer court. And so by uh, by the Israelites taking over uh, the outer court because of these, making it into a flea market, it it prevented these Gentiles from being able to worship God with the, the dignity and, and worth it that he deserves to be worshiped. So Jesus sees this. Pick it up here again in 15. It says he makes a whip of cords now, um, and he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And so um, a whip of cords, it was probably leather. Um, and, and so you would tie it together and uh, you would make it a scourge or, or a, a whip. And it was, um, in some cases, uh, in, in fact, in the cat of nine tails, which is how Jesus was whipped um, leading up to his death, is um, they would put um, rock and glass and metal into the end of it and and, and whip whip you. So um, so Jesus gets this, you know, it's probably is leather, and, and he weaves it together, and and he just starts swinging. <laughs> and and so he's driving all of these vendors out of the, the temple. And and so the, the, the picture that we get here is a scene of chaos, all right? Because you've got the, the sheep and the oxen. I can imagine that they're just uh, uh, running around. Uh, these vendors are like, what in the world is is going on here? Uh, like, you know what? Look, we got permission from the high priest. Everything's going good. Who are you to come in and tell us that we can't we can't do this? 
And, uh, you know, you mess with somebody's livestock or somebody's money, uh, they're not going to be pleased with you. And so, look, he pours out the coins of, of those money changers and he, and he flips over their tables. And so Jesus is uh, not uh, acting very meek and mild here. This is uh, not the gentle Jesus that you might picture when he's uh, sitting there with the children coming up to him uh, um, uh, when he's, uh, uh, you know, tells his disciples, let the little children come to me. No, Jesus is angry, all right? I mean, he is angry. There's no other uh, way to put it. And when we get into our application, we'll look at this a little more uh, with uh, Jesus's anger. Um, can Jesus be angry? Uh, because one of the characteristics of Christ, one of his attributes is that he is fully God and fully man. And so if he is fully God, that means that he cannot sin. So is anger, is it a sin? Huh? We'll look at that here in just a little bit. Uh, and so um, and so Jesus goes, he says, take these things away. Do not make my father's house right, a house of trade. So the temple uh, was different than our modern church buildings are. All right. And so oftentimes you might think of worship as going to a church to uh, to a, a worship service. And you would be right. I mean, that is one way place we worship God. But in the Old Testament, um, before the resurrection of Christ, the place where God dwelt, his presence was in the temple or preceding the temple in the tabernacle. And um, so that is where God showed up. And now uh, we know since then that that God uh, came through his son. He, they would call it the incarnation. He came in his son and he, he walked uh, physically on on earth. And so, and then after he died, he rose from the dead. And now uh, we have God in all of believers through the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, so God's presence is not um, limited to a specific location. Um, but in the Old Testament times, and Jesus, uh, where this passage has taken place, um, that's where, where God dwelt, was in the temple. And so the God's house, the Father's house, had no longer, it was not primarily a place of worship, but it was a house of, of trade, uh, a place to, to make money and uh, uh, for, for commerce to take place. And, um, and, and so uh, we see that the primary, that God's house is to be a house of worship, not a house of, of trade. And then we see in, in, in verse 17, it says, His disciples remembered what is written. Uh, zeal for your house will consume me. And so uh, there are several themes that are going on in this passage. Um, you know, one of them is the importance of purity of, of our worship um, before a, a, a pure and holy God. Another uh, one is Again, this, this view of the, the signs, um, so the fulfilling of Old Testament prophecies uh, foretelling that Jesus is, is the Messiah. And so we see this here in John uh, chapter 2, verse 17, uh, where uh, the disciples, they are there, they're seeing all of this take place. And it says, zeal for your house will consume me. And uh, that is a, a reference to Psalm 69, verse 9, which is a psalm of David. And um, I'll read it here for you. It says, For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. And um, and so uh, this is actually a, a, a song, uh, 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 and a song of of David. And, um, and so we... Um, we see kind of here that that Jesus is um, this um, the the, uh, the he is the embodiment of 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 zeal for 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 the Father, and we know that Jesus here in a few moments in our next paragraph we're going to see that Jesus says that he is that he is the temple, and so um, and so Jesus. Um, 
is um, it, here is 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 calling out the the, the purity of, of 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 God's temple and um, the, for the worship of of Him. And so through this, even and we'll see here in a moment too, that um, this further confirms. Uh, the belief of the disciples that Jesus is the Son of of God. Well, let's continue on to our next section here, starting in verse 18. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for these things? Jesus answered, Then destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. All right, let's go back here. So, um, we see, I mentioned before, oftentimes when we read the Jews, especially when it's uh, given in a negative light, uh, John, the author of this gospel, is speaking of those Jews that opposed Jesus uh, and typically being uh, the religious leaders. Uh, and so uh, whether they were the actual members of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisee, or the Sadducees, um, so probably uh, people with authority here, kind of probably the ones that said, hey, it's okay for you guys to, to set up here. And, and part of it, because of the corruption that went on, uh, I'm sure they had to pay a hefty uh, fee to be able to, to set up a table uh, in there and had to pay a very, uh, uh, a very uh, generous tax tax to the temple as as well. But so the Jews said to him, meaning Jesus, and, and so here's what sign do you show us for doing these things? Now, basically, if we could interpret that into today's uh, terminology, like who do you think you are to do this? All right, we're the ones in charge. We're the ones that said, hey, these guys can set up. They're performing a good service. And uh, we think it's it's good for them, and you're coming in here. I, we don't know you. What are you doing? Telling them, throwing you know uh, the, the the tables over and and whipping them and everything. And but I like what Jesus replies and and um, here in in 19 he says, "Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up." So uh, we know the physical temple which is in, uh, it was in Jerusalem, and we, um, we see here in, um, at this time, it was a massive uh, complex. All right, King Herod uh, was the one that rebuilt the temple. This is the second temple. The first temple uh, was built by Solomon. It was destroyed uh, during the division of, of the kingdom, and, um, and during the, the time of of the prophets, and then we uh, see the second kingdom, uh, or the second temple, is is here. And so Jesus says, "Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up." And then the Jew says, "All right, here's what the leader so It has taken forty six years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in in three days." Okay, so it's taken forty six years. Now there is some. Uh, debate on on this 46 years. Uh, is this a, a uh, 46 years that it took to actually build the temple, or um, or could it mean mean something something different? Um, there another interpretation of, of this uh, because we're dealing with an ancient text and a different language. Uh, so other translations could say that it was built 46 years ago. All right, so it could be that it was 46 took them 46 years to build it, or 46 years ago. Um, if we were kind of looking at the math of it, uh, I would probably say that it was built 46 years ago. And I'm obviously not the only one to to, to say that. Uh, but um, um, we, we know that, uh, that, that Herod the Great's construction of the temple... Um, um, lasted from a, around 20 or, um, BC to about 18 BC. Um, so uh, he built a lot of it during that 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 time. So we're just talking a couple of years there. Now, the temple was not finished though until AD 66. 
And, and, and so that's a, a quite a long um, uh, span, obviously, uh, be more than 40, uh, 46 years. So uh, if it was started in the 20 BC, um, we count down till we get to zero, and then we go up to 66, which would even be after uh, the death of, of, of Christ. He was uh, um, died around um, of 33 AD or AD 33. And, um, and, and so uh, if we see the, the, the term this temple was built 46 years ago, well, that would um, date uh, the statement around 29 or, or 30, which, or, which would be about the time that uh, this uh, this scene took place, uh, which uh, because uh, Jesus's public ministry was about three years, and you know he died around eighty thirty three, and so so um, it's more likely here that it is taken that it was built forty six years ago, and you're going to raise it up in just three days. So and I, I mean we kind of picture the the uh, these the Jews here they're saying look this is an historical building. I mean it took massive amounts of time, effort, money uh to build it, lots of gold. I mean this was um it was a a sight to to see. But Jesus responds in verse 21, but he was speaking about what not the temple of uh, the, of Herod's temple, but he was speaking of the temple of his body, and um, and so Jesus um, is the temple of of God. All right, and so as I said earlier, the God's presence was in in the temple, uh, and uh, but the thing is, with God's presence there is that no one could ever see God, right? And because he was holy. And um, no one could dwell inside, uh, be see him and live, uh, as he, he he said in in the Old Testament. But Jesus is God in the flesh, and so here the temple was not a building, but it dwelt in in a person. And uh, we're going to see here in in just a little bit too that um, the temple is now in each and every believer. And so Jesus is referring to his body, and now. Uh, the uh, the Jews and the disciples here did not know that uh, Jesus was going to die and that he was going to be raised from the dead in three days. Um, but already, Jesus is foretelling his death, burial, and resurrection. But, looking back on it, because this uh, John's Gospel was written well into the first century, um, uh, and so uh, he's reflecting here back on uh, what took place. So he says, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples, what they remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And so, um, and so when Jesus was raised from the dead, this gave further confirmation to the disciples that Jesus was the Son of God, the promised Messiah from scripture. And, uh, and so gave fuel to, to uh, to the disciples to uh, um, really to, to start the church and uh, to see it grow because of their own zeal and uh, which was confirmed uh, through scripture um, but uh, was completed in in Christ's life and um, and so uh, we're going to see this theme uh, throughout the rest of, of John's uh, gospel we're going to see these signs pointing to Jesus being the Christ, the Son of the living God, the coming Messiah, the Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world. So here are some uh, some questions to think about uh, for us. How can we apply this to, uh, to, to today's time? First, we see, how can Jesus be angry? Isn't anger sinful? And um, it's a very valid question, right? Can Jesus be angry? Is it anger sinful? All right. The Bible speaks, uh, even Jesus himself uh, speaks often about anger, right? In fact, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder. Um, but Jesus uh, takes it a step further. He says that if you've had anger or hatred in your heart for another, for your brother, then you have uh, committed murder in your in your heart, and so um, and so we see that anger is um, 
often seen as a, a, a sinful matter. And, um, and so, um, but we also know uh, that Jesus is, uh, was sinless. And um, now there are some progressive Christians that uh, um, um, would, would say that, that uh, um, you know, this is an account where Jesus did sin um, and, um, and to kind of uh, de-emphasize this, his sinlessness. But uh, um, I disagree with, uh, with that, uh, that view. Um, because anger is not always not always sinful. Now, I would say most of the time uh, when I get angry uh, and probably when you get angry, um, um, it is it is sinful. Uh, and, um, and and so it is not um, uh, not the, the anger that that Jesus has here. We, I would consider this to be a a righteous anger. And uh, uh, because what was taking place here a couple of things uh, through the sale of 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 um, you know these these goods is uh, one it was perverting the the temple right the temple was a house of worship a house of prayer and um and, and so it, with that um it was uh, the focus was not worshiping here, but uh, was making money and 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 transactions and and uh, and goods, and so um, you know that was was not uh, was not right, um, and so but also we we see that the hinder of worship of the Gentiles, uh, and so uh, we see the the Israelites were. Uh, were acting in a in a sinful manner uh, by by harming a, you know a, a, another um, God fear, and so we see the righteous anger of of Jesus. Now, um, you know t- while Jesus is um, you know anger actions oftentimes our actions become become sinful. Now, you know, anger is, is an emotion a, 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 of our heart. Um, but, uh, you know, if we are angry and we, we take the law into our own hands, right, that becomes vigilantism, uh, which, is, uh, which would be, uh, be sinful as well. But here, what we see is, is Jesus' anger, it calls, moved him to, to action, and um, you know we we see that there are things that Jesus and that God hates right He hates sin right and so um, he hates injustice he hates uh, um, you know anything that um, you know that that goes against his, his his character and so anything that God desires for us that that Jesus desires for us is for our our own good. And so, um, you know, there are times where we should um, have a righteous anger, right? When we see injustice in the world, right? We should be angry over that, right? When we, uh, man, when we see, um, you know, when, when our, uh, one of our children I- I- is harmed, we're, we're angry, over over that or when um and uh and so there there are times when it we should be angry i mean in fact there was a, a story this past week and sadly it got hardly any media attention but um a number i think it was like 39 children uh were rescued down in georgia that were being human trafficked right when we see human trafficking that should make us angry right when we um See, you know, like I said, the racial injustice, that should make us angry. We should have a righteous anger when, um, when millions of, of children are aborted every year. That should make us, make us angry. But it, it should move us into to, to, to more of, of a, a righteous living. And so um, we, should, we should respond in a, in a way that brings honor and, and glory to God. And, and so, so often, maybe our, our anger starts off with, with it in a right form, but our actions become, become sinful. And, um, and, so, um, and so we need to be, be careful uh, with that. Um, I've spe- seen, um, you know, especially now with, with social media and uh, is that uh, Christians, pastors? Uh, I mean, you just—it just seems like they're angry all the time, 
and they put out their well i'm just you know all this stuff just makes me and i under you know understand there, there you know there's certain things that but uh but we need to be careful that um we don't have a spirit of of anger and so i would cautious most of the time where our anger lies it, 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 we're not jesus and, and so uh we need to be careful as we 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 think of of anger but we also must uh, pursue um, pursue God in everything, and particularly in the worship of Him. So we see uh, kind of the second question on here: What is the contemporary application of Jesus clearing clearing the temple? And um, and so some people might you know think of it being a uh, um, you know, somebody that, that doesn't like what's taking place at church and they just go off on somebody else. And so um, some churches, you know, would kind of look to this passage to say that, um, you know, you should never sell anything in a, in a church building or never hold a, um, you know, uh, like a, 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 a yard sale or a, even if it was for missions or, you know, or, uh, you know, if uh, somebody comes in like a, a music group and they, they have some CDs to sell that you shouldn't um, do that because, you know, the Bible prohibits it. Um, or um, I've even been in some churches to where they have bookstores uh, to where uh, you can purchase uh, books and, and, and different things. And um, I think we need to be careful not to make um, become legalistic uh, with this. Um, and uh, But we also need to make sure that, that the house of, of God, which um, it goes beyond just a church building, is is used as a, for the worship of of God, and and so you know personally, if I think it's often helpful uh, if a church could have a, uh, a a bookstore where there are good biblical resources for people to be able to um, to to um, you know to, um, to to learn and to grow in their faith. Um, I think that honors God, um, but at the same time, there are churches, and I've been in a couple um, that you go into the bookstore, and it is all about selling uh, the uh, books, and um, um, even more so, even shirts and stuff uh, that that are to about uh, the the pastor. And uh, he, it's all about building his image, building his brand. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, know all of the motives in there, but um, I'm a little suspicious when, when I see that, that kind of, uh, of thing. And so, um, so is it a blanket thing to say, you know what, we should never sell anything in the church? Uh, I don't think we can necessarily make that c case uh, there. But I do think we need to be very careful, uh, and and um, and and so. Um, but really, when we're talking about the temple here, and and God um, dwells in Jesus, and so Jesus is speaking of the temple of His body, and we are also. Um, we'll get to the last question there in First Corinthians. Paul tells us that um, that our bodies are the temple of God, and so. Um, and so I think the clearing of our temple, I think a, a more appropriate application of that is, is um, what about our hearts? Are our hearts um, pure and, and focused on worshiping God all of the time, not just on Sunday? And I mentioned in the message, I said, you know, if we... Um, you know, come to church on Sunday and uh, sing some songs, listen to a message, and then you walk out on on uh, church on Sunday, and then you live like the world, uh, no different than the world the rest of the week. That's not worship. That's almost hypocrisy, uh, because you are pretending to be one thing there and another in another area, and uh, that does not bring honor to God. That is defiling the the temple, uh, because we are the temple of of God. Now, the next question, how should Jesus' anger with the vendors in the temple caution us in the way we enter into worship? And, and I think there's two applications of this. Uh, one is the physical, the corporate worship gathering um, for most churches. Uh, that's a Sunday morning. Um, and I know things are a little different now with, with COVID, but um, is um, how does that that you know, how should we approach worship? 
And, um, and, you know, I mentioned it in the message that, um, that it is, it's about our, our hearts, our attitude when we come into a worship and, um, you know, and different churches do it different ways. And I think both, uh, are, are appropriate. Sometimes you come into, especially before church, uh, it, it's more like a family reunion, uh, people that in some cases, you know, you know, haven't seen in at least a week. And especially now during COVID it's, uh, you know, I haven't seen some people in, in a month or better. And, and so you, you, you want to catch up because the church is a family, um, but uh, there are other churches, and I uh, think of the Korean church in particular. I heard a pastor that um, preached at a Korean church once, and he said it was very different than what I was used to. And he said everybody, they would come in, and, and they would st- come to the back of the church, and and uh, they would, um, I think they, he said they would sit in the, in the, like the, the first pew in the back, and they would sit there for a moment and pray, and then they would walk in and find their seat, and Everyone was silent. There was there was no no talking, because when they entered into the the sanctuary, the worship center, their hearts were focused on on worship, and um, you know that's powerful. That's powerful as well. And I think there's a time and place for for both of those. Um, but um, but a lot of times, uh, you know, what we we. Um, enter into to worship almost flippantly. Um, if you're, uh, you know, uh, so sometimes you're you're um, running late, and I've heard, uh, you know, from many people uh, um, in my my years of ministry, uh, you know, that would talk about. You know, of course, we meet at ten forty five. You know, a lot of church anywhere from like ten thirty to eleven. That, you know, what it's it's just tough to get there on on, on time. And um, and I'm thinking. Most people go to work around eight, nine o'clock, and you know this is at almost eleven o'clock. And uh, but look, I tell you, I've got two little kids. Uh, it, it it can things can uh, Sunday mornings can be hectic. Um, but um, but do we give worship the attention that we would to other things? And um, you know, I just. Uh, I think of a sports analogy, you know, for uh, several years, I had uh, f- tickets to, to the University of Kentucky football. And, um, and so uh, I look forward to the day where those, the, the book of tickets came in the mail. And um, it was a, an event we you had to plan. All right, I planned out what am I going to wear? Which, uh, which blue shirt am, am I going to have? You had to make sure that you have the tickets and, and, and we would get there early plenty early because we wanted to, uh, you know, uh, go visit different people, different friends. And uh, oftentimes there's uh, food out in the tailgating. And then uh, I'd like to get into the uh, to stadium early uh, because you don't want to have to climb over people um, and then uh, get our seat, see them warm up and uh, and get there before the band starts playing my old Kentucky home and the national anthem. And, and uh, you know, it's, uh, even myself as a minister, uh, you know, I don't know often if I treat the, the, the Sunday worship gathering with the same detail and respect that I do as even a, a football game, but um, but we should treat it even far more. Uh, and so, uh, you know, each one of us has to, you know, apply that to our own life and our own situation. Um, but also, uh, how do we uh, enter into worship each and every day? Uh, because worship is... Uh, while uh, the primary, uh, not primary, but main ways we worship uh, is through our worship service. And uh, and uh, we are called to, um, in the book of Hebrews, to not forsake the assembly of, of the gathering of the church. Uh, and that's the physical gathering. Um, and, you know, in days of, of COVID-19, we still have some members that are, have been locked down. They haven't gotten out because of health reasons, and they're worshiping with us virtually. And uh, praise God, they're able to do that. Um, but in the context of the Bible, it means a physical coming to church, coming to worship. And uh, and so we see the importance of uh, of that. It, it's not the kind of thing where, you know what, if I don't have anything going on on Sunday, we'll come to church. Or, you know what, if I feel like it on Sunday, then we'll, we'll, we'll come. But no, it's, uh, we're coming <laughs> kind of a deal. Um, but then we also see that we are to worship God all of, of the time. And so um, through the things that we think, say and do, how do we approach God each and, and every day? And and then last question is, we refer to Jesus as his body, as the temple. 
And what does Paul say uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19 through, um, through 20? So let me read uh, these verses here for us, and, um, and we'll see um, that Paul says here. Now, this um, just a little context. Uh, Paul is writing this at the end of his section uh, on fleeing all sexual immorality. And so, In verse 19, he starts, it says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now, um, some people use these verses to say that you shouldn't uh, do anything to defile your body. So uh, you shouldn't get any tattoos or any, you know, uh, uh, do anything to, to dis, kind of, you know, outside of the what's supposed to be the, you know, the, the cultural norm. Um, I don't believe that is uh, uh, what uh, Paul is, is speaking about uh, here because uh, when we know with Jesus and also the context of this passage, um, that sexual immorality, while it is an outward act, it starts in the heart. It's a matter of the heart. And we'll see with Jesus encountering the Pharisees, the Jews, um, you know, they're here, they're talking about the physical temple. Jesus is talking about himself, right? Jesus is always speaking of, of the heart. And, uh, and so here, uh, to, um, that our body, our hearts are temple, uh, of the Holy Spirit, that we are not our own. We are bought with a price. So we should glorify God with our body. Now, yes, we do so with our physical body, but we do so with all of us, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? The the first two greatest commandments, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus says the second is just like it, to love our neighbor as ourself. And so um, I think that's the way that we glorify God with our body through our thoughts, through our actions, and um, and and so, and so um, here it's uh, you know it, we're we're talking about living as as a Christian, as a Christ follower, and so um, so a lot of stuff going on in 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 this passage, and uh, and it. Uh, here and we're gonna see uh, even next week. I'm looking forward uh, preaching in John chapter three, uh, looking at at Nicodemus, uh, who uh, before we get to I'll give you a little insider baseball since uh, y'all are watching tonight. But uh, uh, was a Pharisee uh, and uh, was a member of of the Sanhedrin and uh, came to Jesus and asked what he must uh, do to to be saved. And so Jesus tells him, and that's where um, probably the most famous Bible verse in all of Scripture, one of the first that at least I remember memorizing, John John 3, 16. And so, um, so yeah, uh, so thank you so much for joining us uh, tonight on uh, Live with... Uh, me, it's kind of weird referring to myself in the third person. Um, but, uh, Ed, if this, um, you know, if you enjoy this, please, uh, let me know, give me some feedback on it. Uh, also as, uh, any, you know, between Monday, usually I record this on uh, Wednesday morning. Um, if you will, um, if there's any questions from the time you hear, uh, the message or even studying the passage, I go ahead. Like I said, we're in John chapter three, go ahead and read it. Any questions that you have, send them to me and I will do my best, uh, to kind of answer them as we as we walk through uh, through the passage and uh, but uh, also if you would please uh, share this uh, give it a, a, a like it just helps other people to, uh, to to be able to engage with uh, with God's word as well and then uh, just to let you know about tomorrow night at eight o'clock uh, Eastern time um, we're gonna be my uh, through the word Bible study where we uh, are going through all of the scripture right now we are um, in the finishing up uh, the, the Gospels. Uh, so we're going to be in Matthew 14 tomorrow night looking at Jesus walking on the water. And uh, so we're going to see that Jesus revealed his power over nature, proving that he is worthy of his followers' faith and and worship. And so it's going to be a, a good time. And I uh, hope you can join me uh, there. And then also go, go to our website, uh, adding new things to it uh, as time as I get time to, to permit. Uh, um, but um, 
there you're able to kind of see our uh, uh, our sermon archive of the messages from uh, right now I've got all of the ones from the Gospel of John on there and um, and any other things that you'd like to see on there please uh, uh, let me know well God bless and I hope to see you soon